a late start, but man, it is great to have you here with us at First Baptist Church at Tarpon Springs. We've actually got a really cool morning um, ahead of us. Uh, I'm excited to uh, to have learned uh, at the end of this this week what God has done um, through our church and what we get. I'm not going to say too much. Uh, I'm going to let Pastor uh, Braden unpack some of the things that have happened and what we get a, what we get to do today. Uh, but it is, uh, it's really, it's really cool. It's something special. And uh, so I'm excited to be here. I'm excited to see what God's going to continue to do, not only this morning, but, but moving forward uh, through our church and through your faithfulness uh, of ministry, of giving, of being here. Um, so the, the, the future is bright, and we just, uh, we, we just are excited to have you with us this morning. A uh, couple of announcements. Uh, I've, the big one I've got might take just a few moments, so um, I may not hit everything in the bulletin, but that's why we have bulletins, right? So you can have that in front of you in case I drop the ball, right? So uh, it's not that funny, Xavier. I don't need your comments. I very rarely ever drop the ball or make a mistake, so... This is what I get to deal with on the regular, just so you know. Uh, but so, yeah, he keeps me in my place. There's no doubt. I, he keeps me humble. Uh, the biggest thing I want to point out to you this morning is this little insert that you have. Um, it's uh, it's uh, a kind of a shopping list. So we were trying to get um, our uh, infant room up and ready to go. Should God. Um, bring in families with, with young people. And so um, this is kind of like a wish list. And so what we're asking, instead of the church going out, I mean, obviously, we're, you know, we're small, and money's tight, budget's limited. Um, so to help the church out, to help this ministry, the children's ministry, get off the ground, and this isn't a mandate, by the way, but it's just an opportunity. If you are out shopping, and you can pick up a couple of these items, um, that would be awesome. Um, and let, let my wife know um, that you have them or bring them in with you on Sunday or whatever. Um, but these are just some of the things that, that, that my wife would like to have uh, back in, in, in the nursery room um, to just kind of get things stocked up and, and ready to go. So uh, any generosity, anything that you can do um, in that area would be would be awesome, uh, would be greatly appreciated. So that's what that insert uh, is is all about, okay? If you are a first-time guest with us this morning, or it's been a while since you've been here, I mean, we're so thankful that you're here, and we just want to know that you were here. So if you uh, could take a moment, and in front of you, in the pew back in front of you, uh, there's a Connect card, and that serves a couple of purposes for us here at First Baptist. Number one, if you're a first-time guest, uh, we just love to know that you're here, and so we ask that you would just take a moment.
Good morning, everyone. Continue to worship with us through song this morning. Our first song is Trust and Obey. From God's Word, Deuteronomy chapter 10, verses 12 and 13. So now, Israel, what does Yahweh your God ask from you but to fear Yahweh your God and walk in all his ways and love him, and to serve Yahweh your God with all your heart and with all your soul, and to keep the commandments of Yahweh and his statutes, which I am commanding today, for your good. The Christian life is simply summarized in trusting in God's goodness and being obedient to his word while finding no contradiction between the two. While we may at times find difficulty in doing this, may our song confession lead us in a happy way of Jesus. Trust and obey. 
Not a shadow can rise, not a cloud in the skies, but his smile quickly drives it away. Not a doubt nor a fear, not a sigh nor a tear, can abide while we trust and obey. Trust and obey, for there's no other way to be happy in Jesus, but to trust and obey. Then in fellowship sweet, we will sit at His feet, or we'll walk by His side in the What he says we will do, where he sends we will go, never fear, only trust and obey, trust, trust and obey, for there's no other way to be happy in Jesus, but to trust and obey. I'm just so excited to trust and obey Jesus. You know, I can't. Our next song is Seek Ye First. From God's Word, Psalm 112, verses 1 through 3. Praise Yah, how blessed is the man who fears Yahweh, who greatly delights in his commandments. His seed will be mighty on earth. The generation of the upright will be blessed. Wealth and riches are in his house, and his righteousness stands forever. In the house of our Lord this day, may we store up in our hearts the treasures of Christ's words, which are greater than gold or silver, and delight in the power of his righteousness. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. chapter 6, uh, verses 1 and 2. Uh, if you were present, uh, and I'll, I'll uh, plug this because uh, uh, Pastor uh, Ross forgot to mention it in his announcement, so I, I, I forgive him that. Uh, though it is rightly in your bulletin. Uh, he did not make a mention of the Adult Bible Fellowship, so uh, I, I want to shamelessly plug that as one of the features for it. Um, but if you were there for our Adult Bible Fellowship this morning, which means that time period again, uh, we looked at the chapter in the London Baptist Confession 
concerning Christian liberty, Christian freedom. It is uh, a free life. It is the only free life, in fact, to be a Christian. And we see this wonderfully encapsulated in our free life in Galatians chapter 6. So starting in verse 1, we'll read, Brethren, even if anyone is caught in any trespass, you who are spiritual, restore such a one in a spirit of gentleness, each one looking to yourself so that you too will not be tempted. And then here is where we find the, the wonderful truth. Bear one another's burdens and thereby fulfill the law of Christ. We are fulfilling the law of Christ when we bear one another in uh, their burdens. Uh, and these burdens take a, a myriad of, of forms. Uh, they could be spiritual. They could be emotional. They could be physical burdens, uh, actual you know, ailments. Um, I, I cannot tell you um, how many times I had to require the aid of good brothers and sisters here in the church uh, when I tore my ACL. And that was a wonderful thing. And those good brothers and sisters obeyed the law of Christ in their doing that. They fulfilled the law of Christ. And so we are under a law. Though we are free, we are under the law of Christ to be free and glorify him in that. And one of the things that we looked at this morning was conscience. That we do things according to our conscience and according to the word of God. And so now as uh, the men will pass the plates, uh, give as you will. And in that, bear one another's burdens in that, uh, in a physical sense as it were. And fulfill the law of Christ and do it according to your conscience. Whatever your conscience says. Is over this time. If that's what your conscience says, then, then do that. If not, then do that. Whatever it looks like, do what your conscience says. And in doing that, fulfill the law of Christ as God's free man. So let us pray, and then other men will pass the plates. Lord God, I pray uh, that. Would you please stand for the doxology? Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. to be all with you 
with, with all of you here. And uh, we have quite a special day today. Before we get into that, uh, I would just like to highlight and just say thank you. Uh, I don't know if um, most of you probably know by now, but uh, we have brought uh, Brother Aiden on, uh, on a uh, kind of on a part-time basis uh, to come and lead our music and help organize that ministry some more and help. Yes, give him a round of applause. And uh, he is uh, a faithful brother. And it is quite a joy to have him here with me in the office and to, to talk with him, study with him, strategize with him. And also it's been a joy. Uh, that is a ministry that has been carried by volunteers and they were doing an excellent job with everything they, they could, everything that was there with them. Um, Cause they all have jobs, they all have uh, lives and things like that. And so to, to bring on um, somebody, uh, hey Ross, can you turn my gain down a little bit? Um, it is a, uh, it's a big deal. And so, uh, oh, it's already sounding a little bit better. Um, and so being able to have him around, just to have that be his focus, I can already see an uplift in the team. It's relieved a lot of people, relieved myself, relieved Claire, relieved uh, Lane and Linda as well, and, and Deborah. Uh, and so we're just thankful for you, brother. Uh, and, uh, uh, I'd look forward to hopefully many years of ministry with you uh, in that capacity. So, yes, we do love him. Uh, so, today we're going to be continuing in the book of Acts, and uh, we're going to be in Acts uh, chapter 20. And we're going to be picking up and reading all the way from 13 to verse 38. And so, uh, I'd ask if you are willing and able to stand for the reading of God's word. Uh, I kind of pulled a little bit of, uh, I pulled a fast one on you guys last week because we didn't actually have a standing for the reading of God's word, but this week we're back at it again. So Acts 13, or Acts 20, verses 13 through 38. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, but going ahead to the ship, we set sail for Assos, intending to take Paul and aboard there, for, he, for so he had arranged, intending himself to go by land. And when he met us at Assos, uh, we took him on board and went to Mytilene. And sailing from there, we came to the following. We came the following day opposite Chios. The next day, we touched at Samos, and the day after that, we went to Maltos. For Paul had decided to sail past Ephesus, that he might not have to spend time in Asia, for he was hastening to be at Jerusalem, if possible, on the day of Pentecost. Now from Maltos, he sent to Ephesus and called the elders of the church to come to him. And when they came to him, he said to them, You yourselves know how I lived among you the whole time from the first day that I set foot in Asia, serving the Lord with all humility and with tears and with trials that happened to me through the plots of the Jews. I did not shrink from declaring to you anything that was profitable and teaching you in public and from house to house testifying both to Jews and to Greeks of repentance towards God and of faith in, the Lord, in our Lord Jesus Christ. And now, behold, I am going to Jerusalem, constrained by the Spirit, not knowing what will happen to me there, except that the Holy Spirit testifies to me in every city that imprisonment and affliction await me. But I do not account my life of any value, nor is precious to myself. If only I may finish my course in the ministry that I received from the Lord Jesus, to testify to the gospel of the grace of God. And now behold, I know that none of you among whom I have gone about proclaiming the kingdom will see, me face, will see my face again. Therefore I testify to you this day that I am innocent of the blood of all, for I did not shrink from declaring to you the whole counsel of God. Pay careful attention to yourselves and to all the flock in which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to care for the church of God, which he obtained with his own blood. I know that after my departure, fierce wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock. And from among you, your own selves, will arise men speaking twisted things to draw away the disciples after them. Therefore, be alert, remembering that for three years I did not cease night or day to admonish everyone with tears. And now I commend you to God and to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up and give you the inheritance among all those who are sanctified. I covered no one's silver or gold or apparel. 
You yourselves know that these hands ministered to my necessities and to those who were with me. In all things, I have shown you that by working hard in this way, we must help the weak and remember the words of our Lord Jesus, how he himself said, it is more blessed to give than to receive. And when he had said these things, he knelt down and prayed with them all. And there was much weeping on part of all. They embraced Paul and kissed him, bringing sorrowful, being sorrowful most of all because of the word he had spoken, that they would not see his face again. And they accompanied him to the ship. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, I just thank you for this day. Thank you for the ability to gather. I thank you that we may open your word and understand it, that you have given us the Holy Spirit to interpret it. And Lord, right now, I ask that you give us the power to, to apply this text to ourselves, that, that you would have the Holy Spirit speak it to us, that it would teach our heart what we are to know. God, give us ears to hear and a heart to receive. By your grace alone, we can pray. In Christ Jesus, we pray. Amen. You may be seated. As we begin looking at this text, I, the main word that I have pulled that will be attached to our applications at the end is the word to strive, to strive. In other words, to push forward, to, to move into, to, 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 to work towards something, to try hard at it. And we talked today, and we, we sung songs, and the song Trust and Obey, which I will admit, it's a new song to me. It, is, it was not one that I knew before. I didn't really grow up with uh, older hymns like that. And so reading it and seeing it, I saw the truth in the song. And, and really, truly, the only way to be happy as a Christian is to, to seek to trust Christ and to obey his teachings. A lot of times when, I've, when I meet people and, and I get to help them through hard times and talk to them, that's usually one of two things that they're struggling with when they're going through a hard time is either, uh, first of all, they might be struggling to trust Christ and might be having issues with that and trusting in his promises and trusting that what he has laid out for their life is the best thing for their life, or it is caused because they failed to obey Christ. And now I'm not preaching legalism to you. Okay, understand me here. I believe we're saved by faith alone. But what I am saying is that as we obey Christ, that, and we try to avoid sin in our life, it will generally be a better life to live. When we seek to obey him and seek to follow him and we, we kill our sin daily, a lot of problems aren't going to arise that would... And a lot of times we can, when we do get caught up in sin and... Unfortunately, most of the times, it's only when we get caught for sin that we truly start to show repentance or sorrow publicly or to those we trust. If we were to simply try to eliminate these things before, we would have saved ourselves a lot of trouble. And I can tell you, as, as being part of a church body and having uh, a, a, especially a community like this that's close and tight, if you are struggling with something, um, I'd love to talk with you. I'd love to meet with you. I'd um, love to set up a lunch or a breakfast or coffee or something with you um, and, and just be there for you if you want to talk through things and, um, or if you find someone that you trust here that is a good believer that you can confide in that you're struggling with and let them help you. It can save you from a multitude of sins. And, and so this is my encouragement is in following what we sing is going to teach us just as much as what, we, what I preach Trust and obey Christ, and you will be happier. Though things might be tough and hard, if you are trying to kill the sin in your life and you are trusting God and his sovereignty, things will generally be better for you. This is my encouragement as I read this, as I, as I contemplate that. But as we now dive into this text and we see this striving, as we strive to trust and obey, now we're going to strive to do four main things. First, the first striving we must do is to strive to finish well in our ministries. We must strive to finish well in our ministries. Now you might say, Braden, I don't have a ministry. I'm not working at a church. I'm not a pastor. I'm not you know, a deacon. I'm not uh, something like that, right? I'd say that does not matter. What I'd say is that if you are a believer in Christ, that you have 
a ministry. You have a ministry. Some ministries are going to look different than others. Some are going to involve public proclamation of the word and pastoral counseling and, 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 and caring for the flock in that way and discipleship as a role of a pastor. It might be in the role of a deacon, a great diakonos, which means servant. Some would say slave, which I know that if those who have served truly in that role might actually testify that slave might be more accurate. And you might be seeing this, it might, and, and you may never serve in that role, but I can tell you that if you are serving in that role, you have a great ministry there of service. It may not be a teaching ministry, but it's a ministry of service. But now, what if I'm just a church member? What if I'm just Christian? Say, so you have a wonderful ministry. I encourage you to think about what your ministries are. Your ministry might be to your hairstylist. Your ministry might be to your barber as you talk to them and seek to care for them and just being asking how they are doing. Your ministry can be being kind to others. Your ministry is your family. Your ministry is your, uh, all your family and those that would look up to you. If you're a grandparent, your ministry is your children and your grandchildren. You might have a great, uh, Aiden and I were talking about this during the week, and, and just seeing in, as we study Proverbs and look at Proverbs, you see this talking about how a, a great man is one who passes down an inheritance for those who follow after him. And, and I know that, I know many people that have benefited from inheritance monetarily, okay? That's a great thing to build up for our relatives, right? But then it made me think, okay, is that the only inheritance that we can pass down? And absolutely not. There is this great spiritual inheritance that we can pass down as well. That may be your ministry, to love and care for those people. I can tell you, my own grandfather passed down a wonderful spiritual inheritance to my father and me. You may think you do not have a large influence, but I can tell you simple kindness and love towards your family members and friends is a wonderful ministry. Last thing we want to do in, in, as we age and grow older is be a person that people don't really want us around because we're not very fun to be around. We're not very pleasant to be around. If we become such a way, then we are not leading a good ministry to our families and friends. But we see kind of Paul displaying this point, verses 17 through 25, and we'll just start right back in there. And it talks about that he's now talking to these elders at the church there with him. He's brought the elders from the church of Ephesus. Ephesus is one of his favorite churches. Whenever you read the epistle, it's very clear that he had a deep love for these people. He went and planted this church. He established men who met these certain qualifications. We know that for a long time, Timothy was the pastor in Ephesus. Uh, there's some who say John was also the pastor there in Ephesus at one point. But we see him gathering these elders together, and, and he has a deep love for them because he's going to tell them this last bit. This is a way is like a swan song of Paul. As we talked a little bit about last time we were in Acts, this is kind of the end of Acts here. It's kind of following similar to the passion of Christ, where in his last week of life, though it's, Paul's going to live much longer than a week, right? He kind of says a lot of really good things on his way out on his way specifically to Jerusalem. Paul is on his way to Jerusalem just as Christ was. And I'm imagining he is seeing a personal uh, reflection and a similarity between himself and Christ. And so now he is sharing this last thing with these people he de deeply loved and cared about. He tells them this. He says in verse 19 that I was serving the Lord with all humility and with tears, with trials that happened to me through the plots of the Jews. These are the, the Pharisaical leaders and those who sought to oppose him. But he says this, and he says that how I did not shrink from declaring to you anything that was profitable and teaching you in public and from house to house, testifying both to Jews and Greeks of repentance toward God and of faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. In other words, he's saying that he led in humility from the Lord, that he often did it through tears and trials. In other words, it wasn't easy. If we think that our ministries of our lives is going to be easy, Clearly, we're not reading enough scripture because what we see when we follow Paul, we see through the book of Acts, is that 
life wasn't easy for this guy. Life was not a cakewalk. God never promised that our ministries were going to bring physical peace in our lives. In fact, he pretty much promises the opposite, actually. We see constant opposition to the gospel just by this. He talks about testifying how both, he's talking about the Jews who opposed him, these people, these religious leaders that attacked him and opposed him of all things, who did not believe and trust in Christ. But he says this, through all of this pain, through the tears, through the suffering and the trials, he said he didn't shrink back. And he continued to declare anything that was profitable. Whereas anything that he felt was good for his people, he declared it. And he's going to clarify even further what this is later on in our text. But he's declaring what is good, what is profitable, always sharing about the faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. He, he boasts to the Corinthian believers in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 2, he says, For I decided to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. Paul felt the need to constantly preach Christ and share Christ in everything he did and everything he said, and no matter where he went. No matter what it cost him, no matter the suffering, no matter the pain, he still shared. He still fought forward. He strived to continue on in his ministry. He strived and he fought for it. He tells them that he's Verse 22, he says, And now behold, I'm going to Jerusalem. He sees he's constrained by the Spirit, not knowing what will happen to me there. In other words, the Spirit has moved him and has basically bound him, is telling him he has to go. And it's telling him to the point that he has to go, that he can't stop. That he has to push forward. Though human wisdom would say, Hey, don't go to Jerusalem. They're going to imprison you, right? When you read this text, you're, you just want to come in, the, in, you want to just jump right in this story and say, hey, Paul, I know what happens later on. You're about to go through a lot of crazy things. Please don't go. Please stay and, and, and go try to minister to these other churches or go do something else because I just care about your life, Paul. But Paul did not care. He didn't hold his own life in regard. All he cared about was the ministry of the gospel. He put away physical comfort. He put away his own passions, and he pursued Christ. And he didn't just pursue Christ, he pursued Christ all the way to the end. For we know as Paul goes through this, through this journey, it eventually will lead to his death in Rome, where he's executed. And he just keeps pushing forward. It took his head having to be removed from his body to stop him from ministering. He dedicated his life to it and everything he did. And now what I'm saying is that we all don't just need to drop everything we're doing right now and go seek a martyr's death or go seek to go hide out in the jungle and go seek uh, others who have never heard, which I believe if you're called to do that, you should do that. But I believe in our day-to-day -day lives we must willingly lay ourselves down at the foot of the cross, giving ourselves over to God and whatever he would have for us. We have to be like Paul in verse 24, but I do not account my life of any value nor as precious to myself. If only I may finish my course in ministry that I received from the Lord Jesus to testify to the gospel of the grace of God. We get so hung up with ourselves. We get so hung up about our physical needs and different things like that. But yet, God has promised that when we seek his kingdom and his righteousness, all those things will be provided. I've seen it time and time again in my own life. When I start worrying about all those things, God just comes along and he provides it. It's not always the most comfortable thing, but he provides it. And he promises to because he loves us. We are his children. And so I ask you today to strive to finish well in your ministry. I don't care if you're 25 or 85. That as you go through life, have an idea of the end. Because here's the deal. We have a one-to-one -one ratio. 
right? You know, either, well, you know, we might have Christ return, and that'd be great, right? But all of us, more than likely, will taste death. Don't know when it will be, don't know when it'll happen, only the Lord knows. And so I say this, no matter what point you are at, whether you have many ahead or, you know, less strive to follow and please Christ in all that you do. Strive to finish well in your ministry. A lot of times, this was uh, Kirk Cousins, they were interviewing him. He's recently now become the quarterback of the Atlanta Falcons, right? And just those of you who don't care about sports, just hang with me here for a minute. Very outspoken Christian, really great guy. Something he shared was this, is that early in his NFL career, when he had his children, they were infants. And so those infants aren't going to remember his time with the first team he played for. Then as they grew older, he played for a second team. They're like four or five. Probably not going to really remember that either. However, this is what he shared. He's at the end of his career. He said, most people remember better what you do at the end of your career than what you do at the beginning. So what I'm saying is let's not hold on to what we did earlier. Let's hold on to what we are going to do in the future. Right. We're not just putting in hours and then clocking out and saying, all right, I've done my job, all right, your guys, is, here you go. No, our job is no matter where we're at in this is that we just keep pushing forward with the end in mind. What do you want your legacy to be? Do you, do you want your legacy to be of someone who didn't really matter, who, who didn't finish well at the end, that became bitter and mean? or even complacent, lazy? Or do you want to be remembered for a legacy of someone who was super prayerful, that you could always go to when you were having an issue in life, that you could trust, that you knew cared about their family members, that cared about their family, that cared about their church, that cared about the gospel? How do you want to be remembered? That's my encouragement. Strive to finish well in your ministry. Strive to finish well in our ministries. That is what Paul did. That, I believe, is what the first part of this text is teaching us. We must strive for it. What is one of the ways, though, that Paul strived to do this? Well, we see it in verses 26 and 27, because he talks about the persecution, he talks about the pain, and now he goes into then, what did he do that made his ministry so good? Well, I can tell you that it wasn't just his own ministry in a, in a single proclamation of a place, because we are told earlier in the scripture that he went from house to house, he did it in public and from house to house. In other words, he did public ministry and then personal care as well with smaller groups of people. But this is what he did wherever he went. Verses 26 and 27, it says, Therefore I testify to you to this day, I am innocent of the blood of all. For I did not shrink from declaring to you the whole counsel of God. Or is he saying that anything that is left of you, anything that you are lacking, he is not claiming that is his fault. He is innocent of your blood. Because, why can he say this? He declared the whole counsel of God. Now, what is the whole counsel of God? Like, what's some, is like some hidden gem that like is secret, right? Does he have the keys to the scroll, right, that we talked about last week? No, we know that Christ has the ultimate keys to that scroll, right? Is it some secret thing hidden in a vault somewhere? The whole counsel of God? You might tell me, I want to know the whole counsel of God. Because God's pretty infinite. He's pretty great, right? I want to know it. Simply this. Paul did not neglect anything from the scriptures. There was not a doctrine or a truth that these scriptures taught that he shrunk away from. A lot of times, we as, especially anyone on the teaching team may know this, is that there are certain topics that just are a little hard to preach on or talk about, right? that are controversial, that cause people to leave churches, that cause people to divide, right? 
it was even a little bit of a gamble to preach in Revelation 5 last week in my own heart because I knew it wasn't going to be your typical Easter message, right? But proclaiming the whole counsel of God is not shrinking back from anything in Scripture. If we call ourselves Christians and we, call our, and we say that we believe the whole Bible, then we must be willing to proclaim it, and then we must be willing to learn it. We should not shrink back from learning the whole counsel either. Now, this becomes easier, right, as we move forward. Uh, and this is easier in practice because I believe in expositional preaching. In other words, I'm, we've picked a book, and we're going to march through that book, and whatever the text is talking about, I'm going to talk about. And I'm not going to lie. There's been some times where I've come up on the text, and I got a little nervous because I'm like, man, this is a hard lesson. I don't know what everybody believes about this controversial topic. I don't know previous teachers or anything like that. Or I know that I'm going to disagree with a previous teacher that may have been here or somewhere else. Or I'm going to disagree with somebody sitting here in this congregation and how I interpret a certain text. But i got to preach it. Because i got to preach the full counsel of God. Think back to a couple weeks ago where I was out. And I called up Ross, and I said, Ross, I need you to preach this text for me. And he went, you got it. Called me a couple hours later. Why did you give me this text? <laughs> well, this is crazy. And, he's still, and we were going through all the controversial stuff, and we're like, I'm like, man, I'm like, I picked a great week to miss. <laughs> and he was like, he's like, he's like, if anyone says anything, he's like, that's on you. I'm like, hey, that's great, that's fine. That's preaching the full counsel of God. Before Easter... Right? Now, if I'm preaching topically, which I'm, I'm okay with preaching topically, because I think that in order to cover the full counsel, sometimes it's more like, all right, we need to learn this right now. We need to learn evangelism a couple weeks ago. We had to do that. We did it in a good way. But generally, if I'm just kind of picking whatever I want to preach, you know, a couple weeks ago, I'm probably not going to talk about falling asleep in church, because that was our text, was falling asleep in church. I'm probably going to go find something a little bit easier. I'm going to find something that I, that I might be into at the time. I love studying eschatology. I love studying end time stuff, right? But right now we're in Acts. One day we'll preach the Revelation, right? And then everybody can get their pitchforks and things like that. But, but here's the point. Is we shouldn't shrink back from proclaiming the full counsel of God. And at the same time, just as we shouldn't pro shrink back from proclaiming it, we shouldn't shrink back from learning it. Now, I'm not saying you have to come become an expert in every single you know, doctrine or theology. What I'm saying, though, is that we shouldn't just shy away from Scripture. We should seek to be edified by it, because everything in it is profitable. That's why when we do some of our public readings, we always will pull something from the Old Testament. There will be a day where we preach through a book of the Old Testament, and then we'll have our Scripture readings come from the New Testament, because we believe that all of God's word is profitable. We believe that all of it is perfect. And so I encourage you, now more ways you can learn about the full counsel of God is through Adult Bible Fellowship and learning through Wednesday night discipleship groups. Right now in Adult Bible Fellowship, we're going through the confession, which covers so many wonderful things. A lot of controversial things, too, if you want to get into that. Um, but even the ladies on Wednesday nights, they just started a study, and they said, we want to study the attributes of God. I was like, hey, I love that. Let's do that. So they have books and things like that. If you want one, come talk to me. And maybe you can come join them for the discussion. The guys were marching through the Sermon on the Mount. Just think of the diversity that's being offered. I have my own podcast where I'm going through the attributes of God as well that you're free to listen to. I can share it with you later. But my, my, what I'm trying to show you is this, is that we must strive to understand the full counsel of God. We cannot shy away from it. It is only profitable for us. Some things are going to challenge you. Some things are going to be tough to, to bring in, to get, a, to get a, a hold on. I love introducing certain things to people as we get deeper in things because they're hard. I, see, I love to watch people wrestle with it. Now, I don't like to be like a stumbling block for people, but I, just, I love to see people grow and think. If I'm challenging you, that means I'm helping you grow. And so don't be afraid to be challenged. Seek to understand the full counsel of God. 
Next, as Paul goes on, verse 28, he says, Pay careful attention to yourselves and to all the flock in which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers. He's talking to the elders specifically. Now, he's talking to the elders through the whole of this, but this is more specifically for these elders and for any modern elders. He says, To care for the church of God, which he obtained with his own blood. Christ purchased the church through his death on the cross. Verse 29, I know that after my departure, fierce wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock. And, among, and from among your own selves will arise men speaking twisted things to draw away the disciples after them. Therefore, be alert, remembering that for three years I did not cease night or day to admonish everyone with tears. And now I commend you to God and to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up and to give you the inheritance among all those who are sanctified. Paul promised this. As soon as he is out, he said, overseers, you guys got to guard the flock. You have to be a good shepherd. One of the jobs of a shepherd, even with normal sheep, think about David. What does David kill Goliath with? A shepherd's sling. Why would it be called a shepherd's sling? Well, because the shepherd had to be, he had to carry around a weapon. He was packing. And this was not meant just simply for him to throw rocks at, you know, trees and stuff. I remember being a kid and shooting street signs on my BB gun. He wasn't just messing around with that. No, he was there to fight off bears and lions that were trying to eat the sheep and wolves. Big, scary animals. And so what Paul is saying, he's saying, when I leave, these enemies are going to come in. In other words, Paul was serving as this safeguard, this shepherd, like a mighty angel with a sword ready to, to, to flay anyone that came. But he's saying, this is your job now. I pass this on to you. And now we even see this later in Revelation. We know that Ephesus actually does stray away in just a short amount of time. We know that their first love, they will leave it because wolves came in. In the same way, we must also keep a safe guard upon the church. Usually wolves don't always just come in through the flock. They'll come in through the clergy. That's why it's so important as a church and as we try to grow our eldership here and have more pastors that serve either vocationally or lay, that we seek to evaluate them to the highest degree we can. Because we must protect against wolves. Because he even warns that wolves would rise up from among them. And this is why I admonish you, do not become a wolf. Do not be one who seeks to lead the group astray. And this isn't always through the clergy. This isn't always through the pastorate. This could be simply through sin within the congregation. We must avoid gossip. We must avoid backbiting. We must confront each other biblically by the accordance of Matthew 18, going to one-on-one, -on -one, then maybe bringing a brother, and then eventually bringing in others as well. We must be willing to do it in love. By the way, I am totally fine if anyone has an issue with me. I really am. Some of you have followed it so biblically and have come to me one-on-one. -on -one. And though the conversation might be tough, we had a good God-honoring conversation. So I encourage you, if there ever is an issue among you, or if you have some question, something eating at your heart, please come talk to me. If it's specifically with someone, go talk to them. Don't bring it to five other people first. Go talk to them. Come talk to me. Let's honor Christ through our conflict. We can do that. That is ways that we can avoid and, and help guard and keep wolves away, whether it be the wolves of our own emotions and sin or, or wolves of false teachers. That's ways we can strive to keep the wolves away. And our time is running so short, so I must brace through. In verse 33 now, 
And he's just, he's telling them all kinds of wonderful stuff. I mean, we could talk about this stuff. We could go on and on about this stuff, but I had to, I had to condense it. Verse 33 through 35, he then goes on and he says this. He talks about how he, he was able to, he provided for himself through his own ministry of, of tent making. He was literally tent making. We, we have that saying now that that person's a tent maker. It means they have a job and a pastorate, right? He was sharing that as he did his missions work that he didn't burden anybody. In other words, verse 33, it says, I coveted no one's silver or gold or apparel. And it says, you yourselves know that these hands ministered to my necessities and to those who were with me. And in all things, I've shown you that by working hard in this way, we must help the weak and remember the words of our Lord Jesus, how he himself said, it is more blessed to give than to receive. Now, Paul does not forbid having, having staff or paid pastors. In fact, he gives other scriptures saying, hey, this would be great. You should do this. But he's saying, but I'm going to pride myself in that I have provided for myself. The biggest thing that he just didn't want to, he didn't want to be a burden to anybody. He didn't want to be a burden. In other words, no one, he can't be accused of just doing his ministry for money. He sought to, to do this selflessly. But he gives, us them, gives them this encouragement at the end. And I, and I know he received this blessing because he gave so much more than he received. And this isn't just money, ladies and gentlemen. He quotes Jesus, and now if you have a Bible that has like little cross-references in it, I'm going to tell you that this isn't anywhere in the Gospels, the saying of Jesus which you might then be shocked and say, oh my goodness, well then Paul, what was, it was not quoting scripture? Well, there was often a lot, now granted, we, I know we don't have all of Paul's letters. We don't have all of the documents about Christ. Now I believe God has given us exactly what we need, and it's all profitable. What is happening here is he's probably quoting something that was shared verbally by Christ that is then shared verbally by others. So that's a little fun fact for those of you who like to dig into that kind of stuff. But the point of what he says, I think, is just so wonderful. Is more blessed to give than to receive. I like to think about Christmas. During the time we have all of our family and things like that, what's better? Is it better to receive a gift or is it to give a gift? I know I've, as I've become an adult and have adult money, right? Back when I was a kid, I had kid money, right? Which isn't much. Um, now that I'm actually able to buy gifts for people, that's fun. Can be dangerous, right? Now, sometimes, like you know, we can get into overspending and doing things like that. And I don't want anyone's conscience to be bound around Christmas. And I'm saying that if you're not giving people Christmas gifts, that you're, you know, the spawn of Satan or something like that. That's not what I'm saying. Give within your means to those, but seek to be generous. I believe is what Christ, what Paul is quoting Christ here. Seek to be generous, whether that's to your church. But I think the, the bigger thing I want to focus on, because I think you guys understand the first one, is this. is that we just need to be generous in all aspects of our life. When we find people in need, we, just, we need to bless them just as we have been blessed. We need to give to them like Christ. We need to serve we need to love, and this is an extension of Christ's ministry. And when you give, there's a beauty of giving. Don't let your left hand know what your right hand is doing. Don't go around telling people that you gave this or that. Simply give to that person. Seek to fill their need. Show them the love of Christ. And when you do that, you will certainly be blessed at minimum in your own heart. Now I know that, you know, you might ask me, well, Braden, what about the person on the corner that with the sign that's asking for stuff? You don't know that person. A lot of times we instantly assume, oh, that person's going to go buy meth or something with it. Or they're going to go buy something they shouldn't be buying with it. I'm, if you feel led to do it, to give to that person, gift to them. Whatever they do with it, that's on them. 
If you feel like the Lord's convicting you to do that, then do that. Of course, use wisdom. Right? But seek to be generous. We talked about a lot today, and so let's boil it down to our final four points. First, you must strive to, we must strive to finish well in our ministries. Again, this is strive is the idea here, to strive. In your lives, in your teaching, with your families, in all that you do, strive to finish well. Strive to honor Christ. Next, strive to understand the full counsel of God. I will seek to do my part, and I will assure, I assure you that I will strive to make sure anyone else that would stand up here would strive to do their part in proclaiming the full counsel. I ask you to strive to understand the full counsel of God and submit to it. Next, we should strive to keep away the wolves. I pray that I would never become a wolf. I make you the promise that I will try not to become one, and I, I hope you make me the promise that you will hold me accountable not to be one. Strive to keep away the wolves, and I also pray that you would strive to keep away the wolves within our own hearts that try to bring up little spats of sin that just bleeds out into the rest of the congregation. Let's keep that away. And now next, strive to give more than you receive. And I will let the Lord lead you in that. Whether that be, again, that's whether that's here with this church ministry that we would bless others, or that you would go out and just bless people on your own. Right? Bless people on your own. Strive to give more than you see, because by that you will be blessed in that. God will give you, uh, he will just help fill your heart so well. Now, I'm not preaching a prosperity gospel. That's not what I'm doing. If you, I'm not telling you if you are generous to people that God's going to, you're not going to end up with a check in your mailbox or something like that. I think people like that are frauds and phonies. I think they're the ones actually sending out the checks, actually. Um, what I'm saying is that by being blessed is that you will have assurance from Christ that you have tried to do what he has called you to do which in that alone is just a blessing. So, Well, we're coming to the end of our service, and you might ask and say, well, Braden, I think our service is a little short today. Maybe I'll get my lunch early. My hope is to get you out on the right, at, at our normal time. But the reason we sung some less songs, because usually we have three songs in the doxology, right? And if you're paying attention, we had two. Now, if you're asleep, then you know, hopefully you weren't playing a Eutychus on me, right? We sung only two songs. Why do we sing two songs? Well, we have a baptism today. That is something that is worth clapping. It's, yes, clap over that. This is huge, guys. We are doing the ministry of the church. What did Paul go around do? He went around preaching the gospel. And what's the fruit of that? Churches were made and people were baptized. Okay? So I'm going to go ahead and ask... Uh, uh, Jim, if you wouldn't mind, Jim is our fellow here getting baptized today. I got to meet him after Easter, and we talked extensively. I'm going to ask you to go back with Ross, and he's going to be there to help. Um, and we're going to sing one last song while I get changed, and then I will see you all when I'm in there. It's going to be a little cold. So if I, if I look a little cold, just know I am going to be a little cold. The, the heater's broken. Um, so, yeah, please pray for me. Uh, but... Let us strive to do all these things that we've talked about today. Let me pray for you. Heavenly Father, Lord, I thank you for this word. I thank you for the ability to gather, and I thank you, Lord, that, that you gave us Paul, who is such a wonderful example to tell us how to strive for things and what to strive for. God, I pray that you would help us do all those things. I pray you'd bless the singing we're about to do and the baptism we're about to have. By Christ's name we pray, the name of Jesus. Amen. Worship team, I'd love to have you come up. And we're going to sing, Behold Our God. And I ask you, pay attention to the words of the song. It's a good one. Indeed, it's a, it's a new song for our congregation. It is, Behold Our God. And it is, it is a wonderful um, song about the majesty and magnificence of our Lord. In a chiastic way this morning, I'm going to 
Read once more from the prophet Isaiah, chapter 46, verses 9 through 10. Remember the former things long past, for I am God, and there is no other like me, declaring the end from the beginning, and from ancient things which have not been done, saying, My counsel will be established, and I will accomplish all my good pleasure. Our sovereign and perfect Lord is glorious in splendor. Let us marvel at his power and the good and just exercise thereof, taking full comfort in the solace of his impeachable love. Who has held the oceans in his hands? Who has numbered every grain of sand? Kings and nations tremble at his voice. All creation rises to rejoice. given counsel to the Lord, who can question any of his words, who can teach the one who knows all things, who can fathom all his wondrous deeds. Behold our God, Seated on his throne, come let us adore him. Behold our King, nothing can compare. Come let us adore him. upon his hands, bearing all the guilt of sinful man. God eternal, humble to the grave, Jesus Savior, risen now to reign. Behold our God, seated on his throne, come let us adore him. Behold our King, nothing can compare, come let us adore Come 
Come, let us adore Him. Behold our King, nothing can compare. Come, let us adore Him. Give him a round of applause. 